Um, good afternoon, everyone. We have uh, Lewis here. He gives a nice little chat. This is second last session for the day. Um, in case people haven't heard, there's for the professional developers networking session tonight. Um, there'll be three buses leading to take people. There'll be one from the accommodation services at the top of the hill. They'll be taking 130 people. There'll be a bus leaving the casino and that will have room for 60 people and there will be a third bus leaving for people who are staying in the city which will be down at the Brook Street, Brook Street Pier in the city that will be leaving as well and they'll be leaving at 6.30 tonight the one at the Brook Street Pier has 130 people I think I said that yep. no the only way to get up the top of the hill will be to get to the top of the hill with one of the shuttle buses that's running Sorry? The, they will have about 10 minutes. So I'll, I'll just, the message, just passing on a message. And um, yeah, it's a five minute walk to the casino. But, um, At the top of the hill? 130 seats available on the buses. The accommodation services, Christ College, top of the hill. Yep, they'll be 6.30 tonight and they should be returning about 2,300 tonight. So, anyway, I'll hand it on over and thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And my name is Louis Suarez Potts. I'm the community manager of OpenOffice.org and with Sun Microsystems. I've been with OpenOffice.org now for slightly over eight years, um, since essentially its inception until now with the recent release of 3.0 and now 3.01, its great glory. So this uh, presentation, I, typical thing, sent in an abstract long before today's and yesterday's conference began. And as always, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, the abstract was far more ambitious than could possibly pre be presented in 50 minutes, let alone um, less time than that. So I've done something that I'm starting to do now more and more, which is I just dump much of what I did not say um, into a blog. And that actually is better because, it, well, from my perspective, because it means that I can minimize the presentation's slides. But it also means that uh, if you want more information, you should go there, or you should also just talk to me. So I started off by thinking about what is the problem here that I wanted this presentation, or that I think that we should start confronting. And the basic problem is, um, in a nutshell, not so much where do we go from here, but rather that the here that we are currently experiencing is not entirely obvious, and it's no longer a simple statement of, say, FOSS being successful, FOSS being free and open source software, and against its battle with proprietary, if you can phrase it that way, which I think is really silly, but rather that um, we just have to be concerned about how we are thinking about approaching the matter from now on. So the good facts are, of course, free and open source software is on a desktop, it works, and it is global. Global means we have people everywhere in the world using it now in many, many, many languages. The less good, not bad exactly, just less good, is that public and private enterprises persist in choosing proprietary software and effectively proprietary formats. And the question comes down to why? Well, several reasons to go through. And this threatens, however, as I mentioned here, to, well, if you put it in, say, harsh terms, it threatens to imprison millions, if not billions, of people in licensed servitude, not just for their lives, but also for their children's lives. And this is something people don't really think about, that when a, say, school chooses to use proprietary software, 
instead of free and open source software. They are, in effect, damning their children, those children going to that school, to license hell. That means when they go to a different school, they will have to pay licenses, or the school will have to pay licenses. When they grow up, they will be having to pay licenses to the same company that gave them the software to begin with. And people don't think about those consequences. It's not entirely surprising they don't think about those consequences. After all, we are right now suffering that lack, lack of thought in so many different areas. In energy, for example, few people really thought through the consequences, say, of burning lots and lots of coal and lots and lots of oil. The speculation that this would seriously and adversely affect global climate was dismissed. Some lunatics, of course, continue to dismiss it, but they are just that, lunatics. And they're out of office. The other problem is they weren't really considering what had to be done and how to do it. The total cost of ownership, as it were, was not really understood. Or if it was, they thought somewhat stupidly, oh, the future will take care of it. Sometime in the indeterminate future, we will have technology magically appear that addresses and deals with all these problems of pollution, overpopulation, and so on and so forth. Well, we are in that future, and we don't have solutions and if we do have solutions, to paraphrase William Gibson, they're just not available for everyone. So we are left then with the consequences of people not thinking through government, countries, large enterprises, the consequences of immediate actions. And those consequences are neither trivial nor ignorable, but catastrophic. And free software is part of that solution. Proprietary software's effects part of the problem. Why is it part of the problem? Because we have now billions of documents that were created with proprietary software using proprietary formats and are thus dependent upon the company that created those documents for their ability for us to read them. Yes, OpenOffice.org can read Microsoft Office files. Yes, many others can. But how many of us created documents when we were much younger in a format that no other application can now open? And you can start imagining the problem. It's very obvious. We've gone over this before. But imagine it in a scale or on a scale that is vast. And you start realizing what some of the problems of proprietary software and the culture of it have produced. It can go on. Free software produces innovation. That's basically an element of freedom. Proprietary software centralizes it and puts a wall around that innovation. It has its place, so does free software. But right now, we need a lot of those things, such as innovation. So what now? What strategies of development, distribution, and persuasion do we have to t undertake to change things? How should we alter the methodologies we've been using so far? Have they actually been effective? Keep in mind that most of us have almost zero money for marketing. Microsoft, for example, just one example, can spend something like 500 million US dollars per annum on marketing probably just on Seinfeld commercials that were amazingly ineffective. We have no money like that. We are also a collection of groups, projects, companies, individuals. Microsoft, to give an example, is a monolithic, huge, vast company. So therefore, we can talk to each other. We can be in conferences like this. We can you know, have beers and plot and do things, but we are not part of the same company and we do not have a unified budget, whereas large companies such as Microsoft do. 
So that creates some problems for us. And we have to, I think, readdress or start considering how we go about persuading, how we go about encouraging. I have no specific solutions. In fact, my whole argument could be summed up by saying uh, that formulaic solutions are bad, guidelines good, flexibility best. And that's about it. And I think that's just essentially the free software attitude that if you lay down the law, well, you've got to walk over it. So the good, well, it's more than a blank space. This is just an error slide. With example, openoffice.org. Of course I'm most familiar with openoffice.org, and of course I'm going to try to pitch openoffice.org in this presentation, and I'll also be trying to you know, encourage you to think about it as an interesting example. So it's good because in this case, it's starting to change things progressively and incrementally with almost no marketing money. And I mean that. Open Office of our community has now a marketing budget. That's why I'm here. Or that's what, rather why I'm staying at a hotel as opposed to sleeping on a street. Uh, because they finally agreed to sustain my existence while I was in Hobart, um, whereas the LCA brought me down, they didn't quite put me in the place. So that we now have a budget, but we have no advertising. There is no one doing advertising for us. You will never see, well, you probably, I hope you do at one point, an advert encouraging people to download openoffs.org in a newspaper. Firefox did it several years ago, and it was fantastic, great, wonderful, but we're not about to do that. Nevertheless, at least 200 million downloads since 2000. Languages far more than I can count. And of course, the problem is, you know, with languages that we're all familiar with, is that it's real easy for one of us here, a couple of us, to localize openoffs.org or any open source software, but maintaining it is far more difficult. And maintaining any kind of module is pain and requires consistent effort. So 100 languages, I no longer bother counting exactly. I only count those that are sustained and that actually have a real community behind them. And that's part of developing a local ecosystem. We have hundreds of developers from various companies. We have thousands of contributors. I hope some of you are contributing at some point and so on and so forth. A crucial element here is the fact that we're using the open document format. And I'll get back to that in a minute, but it's really changing how we're able to persuade people and how we're approaching the act of persuasion. And it's, I hope, something that other open source projects can learn from, because the lesson is rather interesting. So who uses it right now? The obvious. Or perhaps it's not so obvious. It's not just consumers. The 200 million downloads, that's mainly consumers. That does not count CD-ROM distributions, USB key distributions. It does not count all the millions in India and China who are using it thanks to their CD-ROMs. Much of software, pirated as well as open source, is distributed in places like India, Russia, and China via CD-ROM, not via download. That's a crucial point, because this marginal distribution, marginal in the sense that it happens around the margins only, but it's by no means trivial, is huge. People are exchanging code, people are exchanging software, people are actually probably enhancing it, but it doesn't get back to us. I would like that it did, but the technology is what technology is. People do what they want in the easiest way. And it doesn't count also governments who are then deploying openoffice.org in their own institutions. So for example, of the 200 million downloads, I'm not counting the 90,000 uh, French uh, federal police who are using openoffice. I'm not counting the hundreds of thousands in Spain. I'm not counting those in China or India. Just the downloads. And what's more, 95% of those downloads are Windows. So you can go to those websites, URLs, and see who more is actually using it. 
The reason why we're tracking this is of interest to people who are trying to persuade public and private enterprise to use openoffice.org or other free software on the desktop. The first thing they always ask us, do you have case studies? Are there other entities, public and private corporations, enterprises, that are also using openoffice.org? Can we get in touch with them? We want to learn what problems they had, how they solved them, and so on and so forth. So we try to record that information. We try to provide that information because it helps us. We are not only interested, of course, in people using it. We also want, and this is extremely crucial to all of us here, people to consider that the use of free software is partly, we'll put it this way, partly entails joining a community. Um, I know that when I approach almost any kind of application or soft, whether software or even outside of the domain of software, it's, I always think in terms of, okay, I can buy this, but I would much rather, say, contribute to its making. Being a consumer it can be fun, but it's sometimes more rewarding and it's certainly more interesting to be a producer. And right now, what we're experiencing, and I, I would assume that those of you who are in other projects have the same experience, is that most people who are using free and open source software are treating it as free software, period. They're not thinking that this is actually software to which they can contribute. They're not thinking of themselves as something other than consumers. You know, it didn't always used to be this way. It used to be, and not just in software, but in almost anything, that if you got a commodity, you were somehow also thinking of it in terms of your ability to work with it, your ability to change it, your ability to improve it, your ability to pass it on. It was yours, and that gave you certain responsibilities as well as freedoms. Being a consumer with no rights whatsoever, except the right to return the crap that you got, is no right at all, and it's something that's very recent. So I tend to think of free and open source software, FOSS, as partly changing that, as partly making people aware, or giving people the opportunity to become aware that they have some real rights here, some real freedoms, and that freedom comes down to being able to participate in the making of that which they are using, of real ownership here. So why do they use it? Well, it's the same reasons as always, I guess. Cost, free software part. They look to OpenOffice and they look to Microsoft Office or Corel or any of those others out there and they think, gee, you know, we're gonna have to upgrade at some point. We can save so much money if we use free, and free so uh, open source software. But it's more than that. Flexibility sometimes trumps cost. Flexibility means I can do things with this. Interoperability is crucial for everything that we're doing now. And that's true for you too. There's a future that's actually pretty important. The second they look to any application, they think, will this company that is mainly doing it be around in five years, 10 years? Will there be a body of people who can give us support? So we assure them that there will be that a community persists. And they also ask, is there a community that's actually engaged in this? They don't really know what they mean by community. Well, there's no real good definition, but is there a community, they wonder, that's actually vibrantly and vigorously engaged? And so we say, yes, we show them how and we show them where. They like information like this because it reassures them that this is something that OpenOffice.org is not evanescent and going to go away tomorrow or next year. And they also like that it is global because many people do not speak English and they want to be able to have OpenOffice.org in their language and maintained in their language. So why isn't every government using it? Just to focus on governments. I've had this conversation 
Um, I, I confess to manipulating a lot of conversations, but I've had this conversation now several times since I've been here. Um, and the question is, you know, why isn't everyone using it? It's not just marketing and making people aware. Uh, that's certainly a problem. If you were to ask a typical person on the street, are you a, um, even like what kind of application do you use for word processing? He or she may not be able to tell you. He or she may not be able to tell you what the latest version of Microsoft Office is. So marketing certainly is an element, but governments are not really responding to that. So why isn't every government using FOSS and open standards, in particular openoffice.org? Well, um, to begin with, which I didn't add here, it usually takes anywhere from two to five, if not longer, years for a government to make up its mind. And if there's an election somewhere along those lines, well, you have to start from scratch. So if, to give an example, when I first moved to Canada in 2005, um, I had all these high-level discussions with uh, Ontario, the state there, of, um, uh, to, on how to use openoffice.org. And the discussions went brilliantly. Uh, they were gung-ho, they were about to do it, they raised some issues of liability and support, I addressed those issues, it was wonderful. But then there was an election, and the Liberal government was voted out. So we got someone else. And so all those discussions, all the people who had been in charge disappeared, as if they'd never occurred. Same thing now in other countries. What's more, there's always a possibility, because this takes so long, of a third party intervening with lots of lots of lucrative ideas, to put it mildly. So that often will reset the clock as well, and you have to, again, start from scratch. Politics is neither, well, it's neither clean nor simple, but it can be a lot of fun. So anyway, the crucial point here is governments make political decisions and then execute upon those. And a political decision is how that government is going to use your tax dollars. OK, that's what politics comes down to, very simply. You, give ta you pay taxes, then your representatives agree to spend it a certain way. They can spend it on a war. They can spend it on health care. They can spend it on proprietary software. Or they can do it in free software. So we answer these questions that I raised here. We start thinking, well, these are kind of FUD questions, mistaken questions. But it takes time, and it takes some energy. And it also takes certain tactical strategy, or certain strategies and tactics. So we say that community, that is to say the body of participants, ensures the survival of any application or project. This is actually kind of crucial, and a lot of people don't recognize it. But the difference between, say, an open source project that is intramural and something coming from, say, Corel or, Word or Microsoft or something like that is that we have many stakeholders participating in the production and distribution of our application. It's not just one company. Unlike, say, Microsoft is dependent upon, um, people are dependent upon Microsoft for Microsoft Office. That's a crucial distinction. There's more insurance, more guarantee that will actually be around in the future. Monoculture dies. OpenOffice.org thus contains in its multitude Red Flag in China. They do Red Office, they do a brilliant version uh, brilliant fork, rather, of OpenOffice.org and RedOffice. It's, it's really quite lovely. IBM and others besides Sun. Sun is a major uh, proponent, of course, but there are others that are really following very closely. And for OpenOffice.org, we tell them, there is professional support. It's not just volunteer support. There's services. All these things offered by contract. And no one is telling people or governments to change everyone overnight. It used to be thought, and it's still thought by a lot of people, that 
in order to start using Linux or Solaris, OpenOffice over something else, you suddenly have to tell everyone that say by June 1st, you must change. And this is a classic and brilliant way of making sure there's no change because there will be somebody who is really dependent upon using Microsoft Office or some other application. Why? They just send all these files. They're really used to it, whatever. So we tell them, don't worry. You don't want to change everyone at once. You want to go gradually. You want to do it at their pace. You want to make sure that new documents are created in a format and in a way that other people will then be able to read them. But there's no need, there's no call for immediate change. There is a change, however, there is a call though for change. Because, as I mentioned here, the status quo is broken. Why doesn't it work? Well, as I mentioned earlier, innovation demands freedom. And software is incredibly complex now. It's also moving very, very quickly. So we want to have an environment where people can freely innovate without having concerns about license and the penalties associated with them. Or rather, the license encourages that innovation, where innovation means not only you're able to come up with better ideas, good ideas, new solutions, but also able to share them with others. It doesn't matter if I come up with a great way of solving this problem. If I'm on the margins, say in those examples I gave of India or China or Russia, it, and I don't contribute anything back, I don't share it with somebody else in a way that others can then further profit, it doesn't matter. I will have reinvented something or done some brilliant thing and it will disappear the next day. You need structures, you need licenses that encourage people then to contribute back to the main community, that encourage people to share with others of that community. Otherwise, whatever innovation you come up with will only benefit a few people. And we need to innovate now more than ever. So, this is actually the part that I thought was most interesting to myself and I hope to you. Why is now more urgent than any time previously? Um, I tend to think that 2008 saw a major change in, in uh, dynamics of history. Like the 21st century finally really greeted us. The end of the 20th century was laid to rest. And not just because uh, Rudd became the new PM or because Obama became the new president. Not just because we're starting to consider more seriously the responsibilities of governments. You can look to Latin America in 2008, some major changes in governments there too. I tend to think it's important because we're starting to recognize directly the consequences of things that we did 50 years ago, if not longer ago. And that we have now that gift of hindsight that allows us to not make the same mistake again. Although, of course, those of us who are cynical might think that simply because we know better doesn't mean that we won't do it again in the same way. However, I have hope, and I tend to think, therefore, that since we know better now, we won't do stupid things again. We might make new mistakes, but I hope we don't do the same mistakes. As well, the tools of information have never been so difficult to access for so many. We think of the internet as being freely available, but it's not. It takes a lot of money to actually access the internet. Money that we're not aware of having spent, but of course those in this audience probably have more awareness than others. It's not just infrastructure money, which is your tax dollars that have gone into building the infrastructure over the last hundred odd years. It's also the ability to buy something that is really not totally necessary, like the computers in our laps right now. And that's a lot of money. That's a luxury most people really don't have. So all this information, increasingly important information, is there, but it's not being accessed or it's not accessible by billions. Nevertheless, governments are wanting to have that information, that tool for distribution of information and for production given to their people. 
Why? Because legacy economies are dying. Um, I was having an interesting conversation on the way over here on, on the plane. Um, and the way that it works, the, the part of the conversation was in terms of looking at how economies have changed. Legacy economy of extraction of natural resources is one way of looking at it. And that is nowadays fully endangered, if not dead. And the example I would give here is Portugal. Um, this is because I just spent some time in Portugal late last year, in October. And the government there has a couple agenda items. One, a lot of the people, adult, who have been working in legacy economies, traditional economies, like fishing, shoemaking, these are things for which Portugal was well known, are out of jobs. Why? The fish are over or, or have uh, depleted themselves. They've been overfished. The stocks are dying. So you no longer can catch the same number of fish in any given day. There are no fish. And there are going to be fewer fish as the future goes on. Two, it's much cheaper to produce a shoe in China than in Portugal. And if not China, the Philippines. And if not the Philippines, someplace else that can be exploited freely or easily. OK? So what do you do with adult males, adult women, who suddenly cannot s support themselves? The government is responsible for them, because Portugal, after all, is a quasi-socialist uh, country, at least in name. It is responsible for giving these people jobs that actually make money. The same thing also could be said in the United States, Canada, in my province, Ontario. Uh, Ontario's lost hundreds of thousands of jobs because the auto economy is dead and dying, or is dying and dead. So this problem is confronting governments, and governments are turning to the internet, to e-commerce, to things like that as a solution. As well, you have millions, billions of children, never before had there been so many children, coming to school. And you do not have an equal number or proportional number of teachers able to teach them. In fact, there's a huge paucity or deficit of teachers. There's also a deficit of school equipment, infrastructure for teaching. And the governments all recognize that you really want to start teaching people something beyond reading, writing, arithmetic, which is perfectly fine in the pre-internet age, but also have how to use a computer and how to use it productively. So governments have this terrible burden before them. Adults who are increasingly unemployed and have no possibility of continuing legacy work, and children who have to be taught. They are turning, therefore, to computers. This makes every computer company, my own included, salivate because we see infinite money here. But there are also these governments are turning to free and open source software. Because they start thinking, OK, in the case of Portugal, and Portugal is an interesting case, we have, say, oh, 7 million children who have to be brought into school. We have to teach them computers, the internet, things like that. We don't have any such equipment. Our schools do not have broadband. They barely have telephone lines. So they need to have broadband. Everyone needs broadband. They need computers. But this would cost an enormous amount of money. So how do you get around that? Well, you can do what a lot of places have done on a smaller scale, which is effectively to prostitute your children to, legacy, to, to large companies and say, we will call the, we will, um, uh, use your software, use your tools if you just name this, um, you know, Bill's School or whatever. And make sure that your children, or that our children use your products until they die of old age and their children do too. Or you can turn to free and open source software. The logical choice that any of us would make, of course, is free and open source software. Unfortunately, in places like Portugal, that's not always a choice that's being made. Because Every decision like that is susceptible to, well, money, to other forms of persuasion beyond obvious logic. 
So this is part of the issue that we're dealing with. In this case, we have to show them that free and open source software is not only ready, but it also promises a better future than proprietary software. Media is one way, interviews, things like that, articles. Something that causes a splash, but also working directly with crucial politicians and focusing on those things that we have found most persuasive elsewhere. Governments get anxious about free and open source software licensing. They barely understand the GPL. If they understand a little bit of the GPL, they understand it as being essentially a serpent in the garden. That once that serpent is in the garden, its bite will infect everything else and turn it topsy-turvy. Make everything bad and difficult to work with. All the corporations that are working with them will run out. They very much fear the GPL. They very much fear discussions about the GPL. They really like status quo, and they really like having very simple contracts so that they don't have to worry about issues that go beyond that. So our solution is to use the ODF as a vehicle. This was established in 2005 in Massachusetts in the United States. Instead of focusing on free and open source software, use open standards. It's a better tactic anyway. Why open standards? Because, it's obvious, you can have both free and proprietary applications implement them. As it happens, the best implementations of the ODF happen to be based on OpenOffice.org. The best, in my opinion, of course, is OpenOffice. StarOffice is exactly the same as OpenOffice, only it's proprietary. But this is an excellent way of getting open source solutions into those areas that are otherwise closed to us. And this tactic might be useful for other groups. I'm not sure. In our case, it's useful because we have the ODF, and the ODF has been focused on and developed and recognized now. But I don't know about others. But nevertheless, most of us here are aware that anything our application saves or uses will be in a format that should be available for others to manipulate, not and using tools that go beyond the ones that we're creating. So in the case of the ODF, there's something, I don't know, 25 at least applications that implement it fully or in partly or partly and are able to manipulate files created by any one of those other applications. We're working to improve the uh, management of these files, the transmissibility, the communication. And that will happen. But right now, you don't have to worry about getting open office in order to read any ODF file. You can use Google if you want. So second, focus on particular people in particular groups. In the case of Canada, and this is true also of Sweden, where I also raised similar arguments, I'm focusing on archivists. Now, as it happens, Australia led the field by having its uh, Australian um, archivists start using and declared using ODF a long while ago. And things have changed a little bit since then. But Australia was a leader here. This is, almost every archivist out there, an archivist organization, loves open document format and despises the anxiety produced by proprietary formats or proprietary-like formats. So focus on archivists is one thing. Educators is another. Schools, because you want to be able to have an application that students can use without having to pay for it. Uh, when I was going to school, for example, uh, I didn't have the fear or the anxiety, because I'm much older, I guess, of having to buy a computer for myself when I was in high school. I used a school's computer. Nowadays, that's an obligation parents have to face. The child needs a computer. That's a pretty frightening obligation. It's a very costly obligation. In my case, the most expensive thing was my physics textbook. That's not very expensive. 
A computer costs several orders of magnitude more, even a cheap one. Second, in the case of educators, say once they have their computer, you want to make it so they're not further obligated to spend money on the tools the computer uses. And you also want to make sure that you're using tools that are actually capable of encouraging some degree of innovation. Because what I think, and I, I don't think I'm alone here, I think that's really great about open source is that, or in the case of open office, not only can I do really interesting things with the application as such, but I can also change the application. I can add an extension if I want. I can change the code. I can figure out how to do it. It's not that difficult. And this is a tool that is fantastic. It's like getting a chemistry set that also gives you instructions on how to subtly change the tools to produce new reactions, new reagents, new things, and then share them with other people. So you're teaching the child not just how to do things with the application, but how to collaborate, how to work, how to actually think for herself. And that's something that consumer education, especially as that which we've seen in some countries, uh, just south of Canada, for example, um, destroys. You can learn how to take a test, or you can learn how to think. The two are not compatible. And finally, you engage developers regionally. That's one thing that I've been focusing on for the last couple of years. That's one reason I'm here. Australia used to have some of our better developers. But there's no real Australian community around openoffice.org. There ought to be, and although I'm here very briefly, um, I would love to see what I can do while I'm here to help foster that again. If it means taking you all here, well, some of you anyway, um, that's fine. We can start talking about it. A community of developers is formed by having people who are interested in contributing, addressing their questions, and seeing where we go. Meeting each other, having some degree of conversation, knowing what you look like, doing things. So what now? Well, think of OpenOffice.org as more than an office suite, OK? It is incredibly boring, almost as boring as this lecture, to think of OpenOffice.org as just an office suite. It's not. I've been trying to get people to think of it as something you might use to make films, movies. I've been having long discussions with this company in Israel, for example, Kaltura, because they have this brilliant device. I recommend you check it out, Kaltura.com, that allows you to manipulate video of any sort. So for example, say you pull something down from YouTube. You can't really pull something down from YouTube, but you have something you're going to put up to YouTube that someone sent you, Flash, where well, you can manipulate it with their technology on their website. So I thought it'd be great if openoffice.org became an interface for that. So that if you're writing a presentation, or if you suddenly think instead of a presentation you want to do a movie, all you do is use openoffice.org find a menu that says movie there and go from there. It's more than just an office suite. It's something that allows people to produce interesting documents, or even boring documents. So it's not limited. The thing that I've been trying to emphasize for the last eight years, actually, is that when we think of applications, we think usually of the application as it was defined, circumscribed, and limited by the proprietary company that tried to sell it, or that has been selling it. And it's in their interest to limit the imagination, for obvious reasons. They get a competitive edge that way. But open source is really not limited. We've gone beyond. 2008 also saw the point in which open source is no longer interested in merely imitating proprietary software. We are actually interested now in doing something new on our own, because we recognize the crucial things that make it work are interoperability with existing application when necessary, and open standards, and code that people can work with. So we're no longer interested only in imitation. So FOSS is free. There's no limitations on the imagination. And I assume so are you. And that means you're free to contact me at this contact information. 
And as I mentioned, I'll be around for a couple of days at least. Unfortunately, I leave uh, Sunday morning at 6, but I hope to be back. And I think that openoffice.org would benefit greatly, as would you, from your contributions. So um, please consider this. And if you have any questions, I have, I think, some time for questions, like maybe five or 10 minutes. Where, yes. Where's your blog? You your blog. Uh, my blog um, is on Blogspot. I should put it up here, shouldn't I? Um, if you just type in Lewis, my name in Google, you'll pull it down. Or Lewis at Open Office, or you'll pull it down. If you type in Lewis, you'll get King Lewis, but if you type in you know, my last name, you'll pull me down. Other questions? Yes, sir. Right, so what you're raising is an interesting problem that we've actually addressed, because that was our main concern. But Firefox and Mozilla, that is to say, Gecko, and OpenOffice have the same problem, which is to say we were created prior to the internet, oddly enough, or right at the birth of the internet. And so we thought about putting everything, including the kitchen sink, into that code. And as a result now, we have a big jumble, and it's rather difficult to modularize it, but we're working on it. But the correct answer is that what we've done is we've made it easy, literally easy, to write scripts using scripting language, any scripting language God gave us, like Perl, um, to, access, to create an extension. That would just bring in, invoke one or call one application when you have an extension. We've also made the APIs as simple as possible. So you don't have to worry about knowing all of OpenOffice or code. You don't have to even to worry about knowing the API in its fullness. You can use a script. And to, to give an example, uh, my own version here has all, I don't know how many extensions there, that were created by people in their spare time to make it easy for themselves and then for others to do things that they do a lot of. They're basically macros that have turned into extensions. And so what we're trying to do is encourage students like Firefox does to write extensions and then to test them. And in fact, Toronto is the center of that. Um, I work with the, with the college there that has these dedicated professors doing exactly that. And if there's any professor here who does CS, if you, just raise your hand if, if you're one of them uh, or know of them, I would, encourage, I would love to talk to you about that because it's actually quite simple to get courses going on building extensions and going beyond that. And it makes money for the student, because in the case of Firefox, there have been several instances where companies have called us, or called Mozilla up and said, we need someone who can do an extension for Firefox for our company. Do you know of anyone? And they pay the student for that contract. Same with OpenOffice. Right now, I have a list of at least 10 companies and individuals who would love to pay to get an extension done for their company's purposes. Exactly. Uh, the community is really growing because of all the extensions. Absolutely. Well, that's absolutely the future of it. Um, we're, I'm totally opposed to bloat. I'm totally in favor of extensions. I'm totally in favor of a many kind of choice of extensions, of choosing what you want, abandoning what you don't want, experimenting, testing, and just having fun with extensions. So thanks for that point, for that reminder. Um, other questions? Yes, sir. One of the things that I have noticed is that with OpenOffice, yes, the product has grown immensely from the earlier days of before version 1 up to now version 3. Um, I was looking at the fact of your site, you need to look at it more as productivity tools rather than an office mm -hmm. suite. Um, you talk about video and other things like that in there. Mm -hmm. but yet there's nothing like that there now. All there is now is a drawing package. Ah, 
So our drawing package does, there isn't yet, this is why I'm in discussion still. And so the discussions are difficult to have because it basically comes down to this. If those of you who've ever managed or have worked with an open source project know, you cannot tell an open source developer, even if he's with my own company, to do something. You have to persuade him. You have to show him how much more fun life would be for him and everyone else if he did this. And he will only do it if he's getting response and community support from those people he wants to work with, okay? So in the case of video, there's lots of enthusiasm, but everyone is trying to carve out tiny niches of time to work on it. And we all see the, the beauty of it, and I would think that should things actually go well, that we will see it in the next six months, some early tests. The guy who is working on this is Kai Ahrens in Germany. And he said he promised me several times that he would have a <coughs> proof of concept with Kaltura sometime early. And so I'm going to ping him again and remind him and show it to you. And if you give me your card, I'll show it when it comes out to you. And if you want to participate, I would love to include you too. But we, I'm running out of time, but that will happen. And what I see as a possible future for the open office at Oregon video and things like that is having it big splashes on our homepage or someplace like that where we can say, you know, let's have a competition to make a movie using this, te this technology. And let's do it now. Let's make it interesting. Let's have nothing at all to do with office uh, stuff. Just let's make it interesting. And let's put it on YouTube as a final test and then see how people feel about it. Because these are tools. We're giving people tools and it's now time for them to produce and go beyond the office suite. So thanks very much. Um, thanks for your patience. And um, I'll be around, as I mentioned before. So I hope to see you.